I am delighted to be here. One of the, the challenges of this webinar format is you can see me, but I can't see all of you. So we wanted to start out with a quick poll just to find out who is here, how, how many survivors, caregivers, professionals. So Kristen is gonna put up a, a quick poll. We're gonna learn about how polls work because actually I've got three more of these um, through the speech so that we get to have a little bit of participation. We can't have the same experience that we would have if we were in person, but by doing a few polls, we can at least get a little bit of participation going. So Kristen, if you wanna put up the first poll, Go ahead and click on your answer and hit submit. And then Kristen's gonna share whatever, what, who's here with us. Through the magic of technology. All right, so we are 59% brain injury survivors. 7% caregivers, 30% professionals, and we got others, um, got some, some folks writing some stuff in the chat there. So thank you very much. So this was kind of our practice poll um, because now that, now that you got the hang of polls, you're, you're, you're all poll professionals, there will be three more polls um, uh, throughout the course of, of my talk. So let's get started. So resilience. Some of you might've seen the title, of my talk and wondered what kind of wackadoodle word is resilience. It's not a typo. It is my own made up word though. It's a play on the word resilience. And that's what this speech is all about. And I promise in just a few more minutes, you too will know the secret of why this talk is called resilience, handling life's wild moments. So what is resilience? And why is it an important topic for all of us here? whether we are brain injury survivors, caregivers, or professionals. I looked up the word resilience, and I learned that it comes from a Latin verb that means to leap back. I think that's important to know, not just because I'm a word geek, but also because that relates to the traditional definition of resilience. Traditionally, we think of a resilient person as somebody who adapts well to adversity, somebody who bounces back, after tragedy. Well, no offense to the ancient Romans, but I've got a bit of a problem with that definition. And here's what I don't like about it. I don't like those words bounce back because they imply that resilience means going back to normal, going back to the way life was before a tragedy happened. And so much of the time, that just isn't possible. Adversity, whether it comes from brain injury, whether it comes from something else, it changes us. I know in my own experience, I think of brain injury kind of like a meat cleaver that just sliced right through my life. And it sharply divided it into a before and an after, an old Carol and a new Carol, as much as I wanted to, as hard as I dried. I couldn't bounce back to the old Carol because I am forever changed by my brain injury. But I'm still a resilient person. All of you are resilient people. So I'm gonna tweak our definition of resilience just a little bit. It doesn't have to be about bouncing back after adversity. Instead, resilience can be about learning to bounce forward. And why is bouncing forward an important topic for all of us, no matter who we are? no matter what our role is in the brain injury community. If you're a brain injury survivor or a caregiver, I think that resilience is something that can make the difference between a life spent looking backward at what was and a life spent moving forward with what is. It can be the difference between a mournful life and a meaningful life. If you're a brain injury professional, Resilience is important because when you're working with survivors who have their lives shattered by brain injury, we have no idea how to cope with these unexpected, unasked for new lives that we're leading. We're lost. 
So no matter what your title is, we're gonna look to you for guidance. We're gonna look to you for strategies for how do we rebuild our lives. Resilience is also an important topic for all of us outside of brain injury, because every single one of us here has been and will be challenged by wild moments in our lives. Those life events that shake us to our core, that threaten to tear us apart, that change us forever. I think most of us have been through things like the death of a loved one, the end of a relationship, a job loss, a medical crisis, a global pandemic. We've all been in the midst of a shared wild moment over the last year plus. Unfortunately, adversity, it is just part of the human experience. Bad stuff is gonna happen to us. But here's the good news. Resilience is also part of the human experience. I believe with everything in me that it is possible to find a way through life's challenges and even grow stronger because of them. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. Strategies for bouncing forward and growing stronger after adversity. So usually at this point, when I'm doing an in-person keynote, this is when I step away from the podium and this is, I have a story to tell and there are props and I move around. And I thought about, well, how do I do this now in this virtual format? Because moving around doesn't really work quite so well when I'm sitting here in front of a stationary camera. So what I decided to do instead was, I'm still gonna, you're still gonna hear the same story, but I'm gonna show you a video of it because this is a story that is best um, watched in front of an audience to get the kind of the full effect of it. So you're, I'm gonna show you a video of me telling this story when I gave a version of this talk for the Vermont Brain Injury Conference back a few years ago. And this will also tell you why this, this speech has such an unusual title. So here's the video. I have three points that I'm gonna make about resilience in this speech. And I'm gonna access those points by telling you a story. I like to do my storytelling away from podium, so I'm gonna step away over here. So the story that I'm gonna tell you, it is a true story. Everything happened. This story happened 10 years ago, actually exactly 10 years ago. It was early March, four o'clock in the morning. And I woke up because I heard this scratching noise and I was half asleep. And I thought, oh, there must be some kind of an animal outside my bedroom window. But as I continued to wake up, I had the horrifying realization that that sound, that wasn't coming from outside, that was coming from inside. There was something running around underneath my bed. So in a panic, I turned on the light. And as the light filled the room, I saw a something dash out of my bedroom. I jumped out of bed. I closed the door. I jumped back into bed, pulled the covers up around my neck, and I sat there shaking. What in the world had gotten into my house? And what in the world was I going to do about it? It was four o'clock in the morning. It was much too early to call anybody for help. I could hear the thing in the next room and also realize that I couldn't call anybody because it was in the room where the phone was. So I sat there for a while and eventually said, well, Carol, you need to figure out what this thing is. So I gathered my courage and I turned on every light in the house as I went and I tiptoed into the next room, which was my office. And there running along the back wall was this little creature. It was maybe this long, it was pure white. It had a black tip on its tail, it looked like this. <laughs> For those of you who are, who are closer to the stage, I have a prop with me today. I had no idea what this thing was or what in the world I was gonna do about it. And as sometimes happens when I don't know what to do, I kind of froze for like two hours. <laughs> I just sat there and I stared at the thing. I wasn't afraid of it. It wasn't ferocious. You can see it's kind of cute. It didn't seem very scared of me either. I noticed that it liked spending time underneath the spare bed that I have in my office. And that's where I store my gift wrap tubes. So it would go in and out of those gift wrap tubes and just kind of look out at me. And as I watched this thing, I thought, you know, 
I think this is a ferret. I think somebody's pet ferret has gotten into my house. I'd never seen a ferret before, but I had seen pictures of them and this kind of looked like it. And I remembered that the day before there'd been a big snowstorm and I had gone out to shovel snow and my storm door had gotten propped open with the snow. I said, I bet you that's how this thing got in here. Now, the improbability of one of my neighbors being out in the middle of a snowstorm walking their pet ferret did not occur to me <laughs> at that moment. But I was comforted to think, okay, this is somebody's pet that's in my house. So somewhere between 6 and 6.30, I decided to call my parents for advice. Knowing that they would be awake at that hour, I would not mind a phone call from me so early. So they had two pieces of advice for me. One, call animal control. And two, stop staring at the thing. <laughs> so I took both of their pieces of advice. I shut the door to my office, trapping my furry friend in there. I took a shower, had breakfast, read the paper. I called the town office as soon as they opened. They were able to come right away. It was the first call of the day. Animal control man arrives. We open the door to my office. The little creature's no longer there. Apparently, he could go underneath the door. So we started to search my house for this thing. At first, we couldn't find it, and I kind of half hoped maybe it was all a dream. Maybe I hallucinated the whole thing. But no, we did indeed find the beast again. It was back in my bedroom, on my bed, <laughs> behind my pillow, looking out at us. I did a lot of laundry <laughs> later on that day. Animal control man took one look at the thing and said, ma'am, that's no ferret. That's a wild weasel. Hence the title of my talk, Weasilience. I think I went just a little weak in the knees when I realized I'd spent the early morning hours commuting with a wild animal. Now, animal control man, by all rights, he could have left right there because his job is dealing with unwanted domesticated animals, not wild ones. But he was a nice guy. He said, well, I'm here. I've got nowhere else to be. Let me see if I can help you catch this thing. So. We proceeded to chase this thing through my house. I now have a new appreciation for the phrase to weasel one's way out of something. <laughs> because this little weasel weaseled its way out of every trap and snare the animal control man had with him. So eventually we chased the thing into my kitchen where apparently between the baseboard and the cupboard there's a little space. In went the weasel. At this point, Animal control man's radio crackled. He had, he had another call. He had to leave. That's when all the emotion that had been building up in me since four o'clock in the morning just came spilling out and I solved in front of animal control man. I think I scared the poor guy. He took pity on me. He said, well, I know somebody who specializes in wild animal trapping. I will give him a call for you. I'm not sure, but I think it was hearing the word trap because suddenly my mind went back to my early morning hours spent with the weasel. And I remembered how it liked my gift wrap tubes. And I said, can we set a trap for it? So we got one of those gift wrap tubes and we duct taped the end. And we put it in that corner, hoping that there was only one way in and one way out. So animal control man leaves. I'm alone with my wildlife. I pulled up a chair and I sat and I stared at that corner. I cried for about an hour. But eventually, the weasel did indeed come out and went right into the tube. Admittedly, if I had not fully thought out the next phase of this plan. <laughs> to this day, I don't know whether it was bravery or stupidity, but I grabbed the end of that tube and I rushed through my house with a tube of weasel. I went to the, got to the front door, flung it open, and I launched that tube right out onto a snowbank. And then I watched, shaking from behind the safety of my closed door, as my dazed little weasel eventually exited the tube, went bouncing across the snowbanks, never to be seen again. I'm sure I gave that weasel the ride of its life. Later on that day, the wild animal specialist that animal control man had contacted did indeed call me. And he was pretty impressed when I told him how I had got that thing. And I will never forget his words of congratulations to me. He had a very thick Maine accent. And he said, well now, aren't you a good little dropper? 
So that's my story. <laughs> So I hope that you enjoyed that story. But you might be thinking, okay, yeah, that was a funny story, Carol, but what in the world is that story doing at a brain injury conference? What does that story have to do with resilience? Well, as it turns out, my little weasel friend is actually a surprisingly good symbol for resilience. I learned that in Native American culture, the weasel is a symbol of fierce courage. All of us here know just how much fierceness, how much courage it takes to face all the life-changing challenges that come with brain injury. The appearance of the weasel is also an invitation to observe deeply, to find the hidden meanings of events. All of us, to find our resilience, have to be willing to look at our own experience, to find our own unique path to resilience. So I promised you three lessons from my weasel story that relate to coping with adversity, and here they are. In order to bounce forward after brain injury, after other life challenges, it's important to overcome denial, observe the situation, and learn from the experience. For the rest of the speech, I'm gonna be unpacking those lessons and sharing specific resilience strategies within each one. And I put these, these strategies, as well as a list of resilience resources, uh, onto a handout that will be emailed to you after the conference. So my first point is about overcoming denial. Now, in my weasel adventure, even though I could plainly see that little creature that was running around my house, I still kind of tried to, de to deny it. I didn't want to get out of bed to face it, decided it was a pet ferret instead of a wild animal, Hoped it was a hallucination, but animal control man and I couldn't find it at first. Denials are really common experience after adversity. When something bad happens to us, be it a weasel, a death, a divorce, a job loss, a scary diagnosis, a brain injury, a pandemic. Denial is often where we go first because reality, it is just too hard to process. It is too much to bear. It's that feeling of, this can't possibly be real. This is not happening. After brain injury, did any of you have thoughts like that? I know that I did. Denial can actually be good for a while. It can be protective. It gives us space. It gives us breathing room in order to figure out what to do. How are we going to move forward? For example, in my weasel adventure, I think I needed that time in bed with the covers up around my neck in order to process what was going on. What am I going to do next? But eventually, denial, it will get in the way of moving forward. I couldn't stay in bed forever. I had to rein in my fear, gather my courage, and face that unknown creature. We were dealing with a challenge, be it brain injury, be it something else. There comes a time to accept what is, to move forward with a new reality. Letting go of denial, that's the beginning of resilience. It took me a long five years to stop denying my brain injury and its symptoms, to let go of returning to my old life. It was eight years till I reached full acceptance of my new self, my new path. When I think back to my own denial and what that was like to me, here's the image that comes to mind. A big old rock. Denial can be like a gigantic wall of rock. It's a boulder that gets in the way of progress, of moving forward. Here are some of the ways that denial showed up in my life after my own brain injury. Maybe some of these will ring true for you too. There was this frantic voice inside me that was yelling over and over and over again, no, 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 this is not real, this can't be real. Every night before I go to sleep, I would think, maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow is going to be the day that I just wake up normal and this nightmare of symptoms is just going to be over. I didn't want to admit just how confused I was. So a lot of the time I tried to minimize and hide my symptoms from my family and friends and medical professionals. I flat out refused to use strategies to get things done. 
I thought that the only way to move forward was I had to push and push and push to get back to the old Carol, to get back to my old life as a teacher and a musician, even though every single time I tried to do that, I failed. Overcoming denial, it is a process. One that can be particularly difficult given the nature of brain injury. I know it definitely was for me. I like to think about things in terms of images and metaphors. And here's what comes to mind for me when I think about the process of overcoming denial. It's seeds, seeds that we plant, seeds that eventually take root and grow, seeds that over time can grow strong enough to break through stone, that can break through that boulder of denial. When I look back at my experience, I've identified, well, what were some of my seeds that helped me to break through my own rock of denial? And I think these are seeds that they apply to brain injury, they apply to other types of adversity too. And they were to learn about the challenge, to connect with peers and reflect on failure. With any challenge, we have to understand what it is we're facing. Knowledge is a seed that can grow to break through denial. My knowledge journey began, it was about eight months after my injury. That's when I went to a bookstore and I bought my first book about brain injury. Oh, how I struggled with that book. Because of my symptoms, I was struggling with reading, I actually still do. But despite the struggle, I saw myself, I saw my symptoms on the pages of that book. And that recognition that was, it was terrifying to me. And it was comforting, but kind of both at the same time. There were so many times when I wanted to run away from what I was reading in that book. But yet I kept coming back to it because I was learning about myself and my injury at a very slow pace, at a pace that I could handle. And I think that's an important point that overcoming denial, it has to happen at our own pace. That if we try to rush the process, it's just gonna overwhelm us. After all, seeds grow in their own time. So whatever the challenge is, learning about it, that's a step towards resilience. I think there's a special magic that happens when brain injury survivors, when we talk to one another, because we get it. We have a shared experience. Peers can plant seeds that can grow towards overcoming denial. It was a fellow brain injury survivor who helped me by planting the first seed that helped me to get over my own denial about needing to use strategies. Her injury was several years older than mine and she modeled a level of acceptance, a place that I wanted to get to. And one thing that she talked about was that she needed to use strategies. And what she said, it reinforced what my therapists were telling me, what my family, my friends were telling me, that truth that I had not wanted to hear. And sometimes I think it's easier to hear those hard truths from our peers, from other people who are going through the same thing than it is from family, friends, or even professionals. There is such tremendous power when we can connect with other brain injury survivors, whether that's one-on-one -on -one in or in a group, whether that's in person or virtual because our resilience can grow from that connection. When we swap our stories, when we share our heartbreaks, we share our triumphs, when we know that we're not, not alone in this. After brain injury, so many of us, myself included, we try to go back to the way life used to be. We struggle, we fail. Being able to reflect on and learn from those failures is another seed that can break through denial. For years, I tried and failed so many times to go back to my teaching and my music. Then one day I was meeting with my counselor and I was sharing with her a whole laundry list of return to old life failures. And she asked me this bombshell of a question. She said, Carol, is it possible for you to accept that you're not gonna make a full recovery? And oh, that question just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I instantly started sobbing. And in that moment, the fact that my old life, it's gone. It really is over. It just seared through me in a way that it never had before. And suddenly I, I understood my failures better, that 
I've always been somebody who believed if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And I thought that I was failing because I wasn't trying hard enough, but that wasn't true at all. The reason I was failing is because what I was attempting, it was simply too much for me. It was too much for my brain. A huge chunk of my rock of denial got blasted away that day. And that's when I finally stopped trying to go back to my previous life and the old Carol. That's when my focus chained, changed to accepting and learning to appreciate this current life and the new Carol. All of our failures have something to teach us once we're willing to examine them. We can learn from our failures. Resilience has taken root. So before we move on to the next section, I'd like to do a, a pause and a poll. I mentioned at the beginning that they were, we were gonna have uh, more polls and this is, this is our, our second poll. Um, the idea behind these is I want to give all of you an opportunity to think about the resilience strategies that we've covered so far and how they might apply to you, whether you're a brain injury survivor, a caregiver, or a professional. Um, so take a look at this slide that I've got next to me and, and think about what's one strategy that might help you now, most help you most right now. Um, and, and Kristen, if you want to put up, put up the poll, so you, have to, you only have to pick one that's going, to, that's going to help you the most. And your answers are anonymous. Um, And we'll see what the results are once, once Kristen puts them up. Got in about another 10 seconds. Okay. I know, I know it's hard to choose just one, but I do have a real reason for asking you to choose just one. All right, so it looks like the one that people are identified with most is to be helpful was, was to connect with others who are dealing with a similar challenge. There is no right or wrong you know, answer here. Um, so I encourage you to, whichever one you chose, to, to write that one down, because basically if you write down the, uh, your answers of the next, you know, the, of these three polls, what this is gonna give you is your own personal roadmap to resilience. That these are three strategies that are gonna be most helpful to you to, to increase your resilience right now. Um, it, it's, it's, it's gonna give you a, a roadmap, a, a place to build your own resilience from. Um, so I encourage you to write down whichever one you chose um, and then and, and, and go from there. All right. Let's see if I can get back there. So, all right, overcoming denial. That was about clearing that boulder. But now what? We can't go back because adversity has changed us forever. The path forward can seem kind of empty. So what do we do? Where do we go? We build a brand new structure. We build a brand new life. But how do we do that? Where do we start? One way to start? is with observation. That's my second resilience lesson. Observe the situation. Now, in my, weasel, in my weasel story, I caught my furry little friend because I had observed that it liked my gift wrap tubes. There is no way I ever would have come up with that idea for a successful trap if I hadn't spent all that time during the early morning hours observing the weasel's behavior. That's basically like all I did from about 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. Learning to observe ourselves is a critical skill for building resilience, for building our new lives after brain injury, after other forms of adversity. The importance of self-observation has been recognized for millennia. It was the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, among others, who said, know thyself. One of my most profound and life-changing know thyself moments came, was all the way back in 2001. It was about two years after my injury. 
And it was the self-observation that I can draw a, a line from that self-observation to the fact that I am talking to all of you today. And the story of this observation is also the story of building resilience. So as I share my journey, I encourage you to think about how my resilience experience might relate to your own journey. And what I observed back in 2001 was there was this new desire in me. I wanted to use my hands to create, which was really strange because this was something that old Carol had no interest in whatsoever. This was all new Carol. There was this little voice inside me that was whispering, make something. No matter what challenge we're facing, I think we all have that little voice inside us that whispers observations, that whispers self-knowledge, that can guide us towards resilience. Our little voice inside, it's a quiet voice. It's one that I couldn't hear until I stopped living in the past, until I stopped trying to get back to the way life used to be. Because the little voice inside, it is a voice of the present. It's a voice that points us in a new direction. When I listened to my quiet voice inside that said, make something, that was the first time that I turned away from beating unsuccessfully at the closed door of my old life and toward quietly walking through the open new one. I think that's an important point, that it isn't enough that we just observe our little voice inside, we have to act on it. Because observation without action, it doesn't get us anywhere. And I've learned that even the smallest of actions can crack open those new doors for us. I started out very small, very simple with this paint by number. Because of my difficulties with fatigue and concentration and attention, I could only work on this for about 15 minutes at a time. Then I'd be so tired, I'd have to take a nap for an hour or two. But I loved working on this. When I successfully finished this paint by number, it made me think, well, what else can I try? What other crafts can I do? So over time, I got into things like jewelry making, and cross-stitching and photography. Our actions build on one another. I don't think it matters where we start or what we start with, because once we take just one action, more can follow, momentum builds, and resilience takes root. I think that one of the reasons that the crafts worked so well for me is that they gave me an opportunity to experience success after I'd failed so many times to return to my old life. I can't stress enough how important it is to find something we can be successful at. After brain injury, many of us, we fail so often that it just sends our self-confidence, our self-esteem plummeting down to rock bottom. Success, it can be like a shot of adrenaline. Success can help move us forward. The more success I observed myself having with the crafts, the more motivated I was to continue building my new life. I think this observation applies to dealing with so many of life's challenges. Start small, find success, and build on it. The crafts also helped me regain my sense of self. For a long time after my injury, I felt like all I was was a professional patient. All I could talk to with, about um, to people was my brain injury, everything that I had lost. Crafts, they gave me something else to talk about. They gave me another identity. Now, I was a person who made things. By making gifts, I could give to others instead of always having to receive help from people. I participated in an art show at the rehab hospital where I received my outpatient treatment. People actually bought my jewelry, which was so rewarding to me. As part of my volunteering at that hospital, I taught other brain injury survivors how to make jewelry. That led me back into teaching, which has always been one of my core identities, and another way to give. I began to realize that I am more than just a professional patient. I can be useful in the world. It's just different than it used to be. Getting outside oneself and finding a way to give to others, that builds resilience. In 2003, I participated in a workshop on creativity at the Maine Brain Injury Conference. As part of that workshop, I had a table where I displayed my crafts. It was also my very first opportunity to speak publicly about my brain injury. My speech was all of five minutes long, 
And I was so nervous that my knees shook the entire time I was up there. Sharing my story in front of others, was it was a risk. But I've learned that resilience, it doesn't build unless we're willing to take on some risk. Unless we are willing to, to feel the fear and we choose to move forward anyway. Resilience grows when we break new ground, when we push our boundaries one small step at a time. When I spoke at that conference, it increased my self-esteem, my self-confidence. It showed me that there was power in my story, that I could use what I'd been through to help others. And it made me feel like maybe there could be some value, some purpose in everything that I'd been through. And even though I was so nervous getting up there to speak, I felt like I'm home. This, this is where I belong. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I knew that I wanted to do more speaking about brain injury. Sometimes when we're in the midst of adversity, it can seem like the steps we're taking, they are so small, they're so slow. It can seem like we're not moving at all. But I've learned that over, over time, small and slow can grow into something big and unexpected. Here's how that concept has kind of played out for me. It's now been 18 years since I gave my first five minute knee knocking speech about brain injury. Since then, I've gone from being part of panels to giving short talks, to organizing workshops, to delivering keynotes, to now doing virtual keynotes. In 2010, my mentor and I founded the main base survivor volunteer group, Brain Injury Voices. You can see the statistics of what we've accomplished in the last 11 years. We're proof that brain injury survivors working together, we can make a difference by focusing on what it is that we can do. It was by focusing what I can do, one small step at a time, that I wrote my book, To Root and to Rise, Accepting Brain Injury. It took me 12 years to write this book. It is a book and a workbook designed to help brain injury survivors to move forward with their new lives. That's the very definition of resilience that we're talking about today. The journey that led me to this moment, talking to all of you today, it began with an observation. It began with listening to that little voice inside me all those years ago that said, make something. Those words, make something, they're about so much more than just doing something with my hands. I didn't recognize it back then, but what I know now, all those words, make something, they also refer to making something out of tragedy, turning suffering into something meaningful. Now, I didn't choose to have a brain injury. None of us choose to have adversity visit our lives. But one thing we can choose is to make something out of it. Making meaning is another part of resilience. I'm choosing to do that as a brain injury speaker, book author, and the leader of Brain Injury Voices. I never would have dreamed it, but I found my life's work through this. But there are so many other ways one can make meaning out of adversity. It's about whatever brings us a sense of purpose. That could be spending time with family and friends, volunteering, creative pursuits like art, crafts, music, or writing, helping someone, caring for animals, tending a garden, or devoting time to a spiritual practice. However it is that we choose to make meaning, the process begins with self-observation, with listening to our own little voice inside. So it's time for our second pause and poll to, to think for a moment about the resilient strategies that I've just covered and how they might apply to you as a brain injury survivor, caregiver, professional, and to choose one that you think could be um, most helpful for you. So Kristen, if you wanna put up the poll. Several options. People are being a little yeah. more. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of options here. So yes, yeah. you need to give people a little bit more time on this one. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of strategies in this one. Mm 
All right, maybe another 10 seconds to make your final choice. Hmm. So I think it looks like finding success was the one that, 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 that more people chose, although this one was a little bit more, more evenly um, distributed. Again, no, no right or wrong answers. It's about, about your own journey and what you think might, might be, be helpful. Um, but I think, I think it, is, it is interesting that I, because I, I do, that success really is so, so very, so very important. And again, I do encourage you to, um, to write down whichever one you chose as, as part of kind of creating your own resilience roadmap. So within this speech, I've been kind of building a resilience structure. We've been moving from the ground upward, overcoming denial. That was our demolition phase. Observe the situation. That was the construction phase. My third phase, learn from the whole experience. That's about the big picture. That's about gaining perspective. There's always learning to be found in any life-changing event. That is one of my core beliefs. It's also an attitude that contributes to resilience. Now, learning from life's challenges, of course, it doesn't change the fact that the challenge, whatever it is, is extremely difficult to cope with. Having a weasel in my house was not easy. Having a brain injury has been the greatest challenge of my life. But when we can figure out what it is that adversity has to teach us and use that learning to keep moving forward, that increases our resilience. When something bad happens, it's really common to ask, why did this awful thing have to happen to me? How many of us have said something like that to ourselves? I know I have. The problem is that that question, it doesn't have an answer. That question tends to lead to sadness, anger, frustration, disappointment, not insight. Here are a couple of questions that can lead us towards resilience. What can I learn from this situation? What does this challenge have to teach me? So can a weasel be a teacher? You probably know my answer is gonna be yes. The biggest lesson that I learned from that weasel, it actually has to do with resilience. And what I realized is that it doesn't matter if how I handle situations is not always pretty. It doesn't matter if it takes me a long time to figure things out, if I cry while I do it, if I get confused, if I have to spend hours or days resting on the couch afterwards. What matters is that I know without a doubt, I will continue to persevere and I will slowly find my way. Brain injury has been the greatest teacher of my life. Here are three lessons that brain injury has taught me that relate to resilience. Look for silver linings, find humor, and express gratitude. There's research out there that supports that these are perspectives that contribute to resilience, doesn't matter what challenge one is facing. I found these perspectives to be very helpful during this time of pandemic too. I've always been a really big believer in the concept of silver linings, that something good can come from something bad. Brain injury put that to its biggest, that belief to its biggest challenge ever. It is so difficult to find silver linings in something as life-consuming as brain injury is. It's much easier to list all the negative consequences of brain injury. They're very numerous, very real. They turn our lives upside down and inside out. It took years for me to find the silver linings to my brain injury. At first, all I had to hold on to was my belief that they were there, even if I couldn't see them yet. And I'll be honest, there were times when my belief in the possibility of silver linings, it was one of the things that kept me from ending my life during the early years. I had to believe that something good was gonna come from everything that I was going through. So if you're in that place, where you can't see how there could possibly be any silver linings to what you're going through, please believe that you can find them, you will find them. 
I think of silver linings as being on one half of a balance scale, with brain injury being the enormous load on the other side. We need something to counterbalance some of that downward weight that is brain injury. Here are a few of my silver linings. Because of brain injury, I think I know more of what it is to struggle, and I'm a better person because of it, with more empathy, compassion, perception, and wisdom. Because of brain injury, I'm less of a perfectionist. I've always been a kind of a hard driving type A person. Now I say I'm more of like a type A minus person. Because of brain injury, I have a clearer sense of purpose in my life. Brain injury gave me passion for a cause that my life didn't have before. Now, some of those silver linings might make it sound like, geez, brain injury was the best thing that ever happened to her. It wasn't, it was the worst. Silver linings, they don't erase all the many challenges of brain injury, but they do make them easier to live with. They even out that scale just a little bit. Being able to see the positive within the negative is a hallmark of resilience. So I encourage you to think about brain injury or any other challenges and try to find a silver lining. Adversity is not funny. Brain injury is definitely not funny. We can't change all the bad stuff that's happened to us. But over time, we can learn to view pieces of it in a different light, from a different perspective. As Mark Twain said, humor is tragedy plus time. Humor is an age-old strategy for coping with adversity. When life is falling apart and out of our control, sometimes all we can do is laugh. Humor, it's like WD-40. It's the grease that makes everything move more smoothly. Now, just like silver linings, humor does not change the challenges of brain injury one iota, but it can make those challenges a little bit more bearable. It took me time, but eventually I learned to view my own symptoms a little bit more lightheartedly. So one of the ways I did that was by naming my brain injury. A lot of the times it seems like I've got two very different people living in my head. There's me, then there's a the brain injury. And I'll tell you my brain injury, she is kind of a diva. She's the one in charge who gets what she wants when she wants it. She's kind of a drama queen. So I said, well, let's give her a dramatic name. So I call her Brain Hilda. A lot of my Brain Hilda humor centers on my most challenging symptoms, which was and continues to be unpredictable and oftentimes extreme mental fatigue. I have rested every day, oftentimes multiple times a day, for nearly 22 years now. I rested before giving this speech today. I will rest again after giving this speech today. So due to my mental fatigue, sometimes that has meant that I have had to, to lie down in public places because when Brain Hilda is taking me down, it really does not matter where I, where I am. I have to obey. So here are some of the odder places that I have had to take a nap. I have rested in a classroom at a craft store in the coffin display room at a funeral home. I did not rest in a coffin, I rested on a couch. At the bedding department in a furniture store, a hotel bar, I had not been drinking and the sign did say bar and lounge, a golf course pro shop, a fishing boat, and the Washington DC conference room of my US Senator. So given all that, I tell people, I sleep around. My motto, is one that any Star Trek fans will appreciate. To boldly nap where no one has napped before. Humor is a healthy choice we can make for ourselves. When we can laugh, we are resilient. So I encourage you to look for ways to laugh, to choose to be amused. It's been my experience that when life is at its worst, that's when expressing gratitude can be most beneficial. Given that we've been living through an especially stressful time over the last year plus, I thought it would be beneficial to try a group gratitude exercise. So I'm gonna ask you to think about the following statements. Today I'm grateful for this person in my life. This simple pleasure I enjoy. This thing that makes me smile or laugh. This information I learned today. 
as you think about your answers, how do you feel? Take just a moment and check in with yourself. Pay attention to what's happening physically, mentally, emotionally. I know that when I focus on what I'm grateful for, I feel muscles relaxing. I feel a smile growing. I feel a lightness that takes over me. Gratitude, it is one of the simplest, yes, most, most powerful resilience tools there is. Looking for expressing gratitude it is a choice, the choice we make for ourselves. It's about choosing to find something to be thankful for, even within the midst of the darkest of feelings. It's about letting the sadness, the anger, the fear of what's happened to us have their place, but making a conscious decision to turn away from those emotions, at least for a short time, to focus on being thankful. It's about finding a way to live with all the harsh realities of brain injury. So I invite all of you to look for regular opportunities to express gratitude, most especially during those times when you're struggling. Before I begin to wind down this speech, it's time for our last pause and poll. So again, I encourage you to reflect on the resilient strategies that I just covered and how they might apply to you as a survivor, caregiver, or professional. And Kristen, when you're ready, go ahead and, and, and put up a poll. Um, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all very well practiced at the whole poll thing now. We're poll pros. Um, I think we'll go with 10 seconds starting now. All right, so it looks like, like that, that more people chose gratitude as, a, as a, um, a strategy. And again, no right or wrongs. It's about whatever is, is you think is most helpful to you at this, at this time. And again, I encourage you to, to write that down because now you have three resilient strategies that you think are most helpful to you right now. So you have a place to start on your own journey. So we went on a resilience journey today. We started out with my funny weasel adventure and we moved through the bouncing forward lessons that were inspired by it. Overcome denial, observe the situation and learn from the experience. To close, I've written a little poem, something that brings together all the points that I've made and combines my serious topic of resilience with just a little bit of weasel inspired whimsy. Here it is. When life throws you weasels, what do you do? First instinct is to hide because you don't have a clue. Emerge from denial. Look it square in the face. When you choose to turn forward is when you really start the race. Strategies are possible if you observe with care. Help can be found when you look everywhere. So learn from this moment and you'll manage with brilliance. Then you too can proudly say, I have resilience. <laughs>